Uh, we now move into our um, second theme. So from health, demographic change and wellbeing, we move into climate action, resource efficiency and raw materials. I'm delighted to welcome Paul uh, and Francis to the stage. Thank you. Okay, um, hello everybody. My name's um, Paul Lund from Environmental Sciences here at the University, and this is uh, Francis Cooper from uh, Dartmoor National Park, the uh, Myers Project um, Officer. Now, the Myers Project has a principal aim of restoring ecosystem services um, to uh, degraded um, peatland areas, and Francis and I have been working together for five years, uh, the University providing advice on uh, monitoring um, design, data analysis, and also um, various uh, student projects. Now, I'm, um, I'm basically the, um, the bread in this. Uh, Francis is going to be talking um, as the filling um, about the actual project, and then we'll finish up on a, um, on a few uh, results. But before we, um, we go on to that, I basically wanted to um, ask this question, basically. What does Dartmoor do for us? In terms of environmental science, uh, environmental um, and ecosystem services, Dartmoor, this large block of black granite, stores over 60 million um, tonnes of carbon, so in terms of climate mitigation, very important, and sequesters about 10,000 tonnes um, per annum. Um, in terms of wildlife, it holds most of our prized species and uh, sites of nature conservation. And in terms of water, it intercepts um, some 70% of our drinking water and also um, attenuates uh, peak floods uh, further downstream in our river system, so very important, and attracts from an economic point of view 4.5 million visitors. So we have a, a vested interest in making sure that this is in, the, um, in its best uh, possible condition. I'm going to hand over to Francis now. Thanks, Paul. Um, the Dartmoor Myers project um, is a, a five-year uh, partnership pilot project which has just come to an end. Um, uh, in March this year. Um, the partners were, were listed on, on the first slide. Um, and I mention that because um, although the, the, the project was led from Dartmouth National Park Authority, substantially funded by South West Water, um, but a whole range of partners have been involved in it. Um, and they are all really important. The project was established to... Um, investigate the feasibility and effects of undertaking Maya restoration on, on Dartmoor. Um, and as such, evidence gathering has been really important um, and relationships with academic partners, um, in particular Exeter and Plymouth universities, have been really important in doing that. And one of the really important things that we wanted to um, do with this work was establish good baselines in order to be able to um, assess uh, the effectiveness Oh, sorry, going the wrong way. Um, so peatlands on, on, on Dartmoor, um, we estimate that there's around um, 8,500 hectares of uh, peatlands, but there's a lot of variability um, in terms of the type of peatland um, and its, its quality. Of that, um, only around 300 hectares is really high quality, um, intact um, blanket bog. Um, of the kind that delivers the full range of ecosystem service benefits. Um, beyond that, there's around 700 hectares, um, which is the, the blue areas in the centre of, of Dartmoor's North Moor on the, on the, uh, on the map there, um, which is relatively high quality, um, but shows signs of small erosion gullies. Um, these have, have resulted from impacts of various human activities over time. Um, peat cutting um, is, is one of those. Military activity is probably really important as well. Um, burning and a, a, a range of factors um, which have resulted in fracturing of the surface of, of, of the bog um, and caused the onset of the um, erosion. Um, on the left-hand side, uh, um, side of the slide, um, that's what we would like our bogs to, um, to look like. So that's an example of very high quality um, blanket bog on, on Dartmoor. Um, and on the right-hand side, very severe erosion um, from the Hangstone Hill area. Um, shows what happens once that sort of fracturing um, uh, develops um, and, uh, and becomes very severe. Um, 
this tends to, to mean that it's a, a lot of carbon is lost, um, probably impacts on uh, certainly um, the way that water behaves on the moor um, and, and water quality, leaves the landscape of peat hags, eroding, eroding peat um, and very modified vegetation. Uh, these are the pilot uh, sites that we worked on. Prior to the Dartmoor Mines project itself, uh, we did some very limited intervention uh, in the Blackerbrook area um, and, um, and then followed that up with the, the more northerly sites here, um, which are, are the um, sites where the, the vegetation monitoring um, that, that uh, Paul is going to go on to uh, uh, are located, uh, and this, this slide is just to give you a little bit of context of the sorts of areas, remote Dartmoor areas that we're working in. Um, the restoration, the intervention that we um, did re uh, concentrated on relocating areas of peat within the vicinity of the eroding gullies um, to try to hold water on the site. Um, so this just gives you an, an example um, of, of the, how the areas look before and after monitoring. Um, we have baselines on all of our uh, monitoring sites. We have trialled different sorts of um, methodologies. Um, and although this stage of project work is um, finished, uh, monitoring will continue for, a, for another five years. I'm going to hand over to Paul. So initial results, and I say they are initial because we're only five years into the project and it takes a while for things to recover, um, show are really promising for all sites that there are two phases of recovery. The first is the um, from the ditch blocking and gully blocking is the actual hydrological restoration. And this slide here shows quite nicely for our um, restored sites. These were restored in 2008 at Blackerbrook Down, and you can see the uh, increase in the cover of standing water. Um, and particularly initially, and then eventually this becomes... Um, this becomes uh, covered in an in a, uh, uh, aquatic sphagnum and, um, and you get the process of terrestrialisation. It's a very important recovery. So that's the first kind of stage, elevation of the actual water table. Um, also, of course, is we want to get down the bare peat areas, these eroding peat areas. And this is the same site restored in 2008, initial levels, high levels of bare peat and dropping off quite consistently. Uh, quite uh, strongly and significantly, particularly in the, um, in the restored areas. So we're covering up those bare peak, and we see this in the majority of the sites that are restored. The species that start to colonise, particularly the standing water areas, are the aquatic sphagnum. Um, so they're infilling the, pool, the pools in this process of terrestrialisation. The same site, again, restored in 2008. Here's the restored quadrats. You get a, um, an initial um, growth after about two years of the sphagnum over the surface of the pool, and that carries on up until um, 2013, whereas the control areas, uh, we don't see this, this actual change. So early signs are, uh, for all sites, um, that there's a degree of recovery um, to peat-forming vegetation. And the restored sites have undergone a succession from bare peat, standing water, to these sphagnum um, communities. Terrestrial Maya species have been slow to spread, uh, uh, with no change in all but the very oldest sites. And I also want to go back to Tim's point and make a plug about the um, gallery. If you're interested in peats and soils, I recommend that you have a look in, in the ground floor of the Ronald Levinsky building here today. Okay, thank you. <laughs>